folks. Hello, hello everyone. Welcome to another episode of Island Forward Live. It's me, David Mullings. Brought my vision 2030 again. We're going to talk about growing the Jamaican economy. Hoping to get some questions and some more interactivity this time. I'm also streaming live on Instagram on my personal profile just to you know, just help get more people involved. I see we have one viewer coming in now, two popping in. Thank you. I'm going to make sure I can see any, any questions that pop up. So I'm looking forward to that. And this is going to be a lot of fun. I know that we, you know, we in the diaspora, uh, some of us have not been back to Jamaica that often. But we, we pay attention to the news. Most of us don't have a copy of Vision 2030 and we've never read it. But we, we have some understanding of, of economics, even the most basic things, because we, we've lived through it. Right? We, we're at a point where we've seen other countries do extremely well, while you know, Jamaica in the past historically has struggled. We, we've now gotten very positive news coming out about us. And, and that, that matters because we need to also change our, our mindset about what comes next. There is obviously a big question as to whether or not is this time different? Is this sustainable? And, and that's, those are fair questions. I think we all should ask that. So what I want to start with is, is really laying some context and then giving a little report actually. Some, some interesting things have come out, but in, in Vision 2030, it actually had a, a proposed indicators and targets for the national outcome. And this national outcome, uh, number seven, was a stable macroeconomy. Right? So we all want a stable economy, whether it's in the US, Canada, UK, Jamaica especially though, because we have friends and family. Oh man, you've been to Jamaica 15 times. We need to get that even more, Sandra. We need to, we need to up that number, but that's great to have been there 15 times. Uh, let's, let's keep that love going and bring some friends next time. And, you, know, you probably brought friends, but let's keep letting them know there's good stuff. But, but national outcome number seven was a stable macroeconomy. And they set some very simple targets and they have outcome indicators, right? We need to know what to look at so we can turn around and measure ourselves against it. There, there's a book I like called Measure What Matters. So you know, for those of us who, who've done any sort of business consulting or, or work in the corporate world or project management especially, you know that you measure things. You need to see where, where your targets are and where your actual is, actual versus plan. Figure out what's going wrong, what's going right, and then can iterate at scale. So the first thing they wanted to look at was nominal GDP per capita, right? So the gross domestic product per person in the country. Uh, back in 2007, it was 4,817 US dollars. 4,817. That is a third of what it is for Latin America and the Caribbean. The, the LAC region is roughly 12,500. In 2012, the proposed target was 5,354. 2015 was 6,629. By 2030, we want to get Jamaica to 23,567 US dollars per capita in terms of GDP. So that's not per capita income, that's not the average revenue for us, but just GDP for the country itself. We want to scale it. So I think right now we, we're somewhere in the, the 6,250 range or somewhere around that. So we, we're making progress. Let, let's give credit there. The real GDP annual growth rate, 2007 said 1.4%, target in 2012 was 3%, we didn't make that. Target for 2015 and 2013 is 5%. And that is actually what the Jamaica's Economic Growth Council is chairing. Some of you have seen my sit down with Michael Leachin, Jamaican Canadian billionaire, who is a chairman and they've talked about five in four. They want to get to 5% growth per year within four years. So. We haven't hit the 5% as yet, but you know, Jamaica's growth rate is, is like 10 times what it used to be for the last 30 years. So, so you have to admit, you know, the numbers just came out from the Planning Institute of Jamaica. Obviously, there are some people who are going to say they don't trust the numbers, but the PIOJ is separate from the government. Uh, PIOJ is not political, and they report the numbers regardless of what anybody says. The BOJ says the same thing. And so we had 1% growth last quarter, 1% GDP growth for the last three months in Jamaica. So that's, that's really positive, but we're not there as yet. 5% is a target. 
and we haven't even hit the 2012 target of 3% as yet. So, so we're behind on that, but it is positive. Debt to GDP ratio, right? The baseline was 111.4 in 2007, our, our debt to GDP ratio climbed. We all know that, man, we had a debt problem in Jamaica. We were the Greece of the Western Hemisphere. You know, like 60 cents of every dollar that they took in was paid out to service debt, both interest and and the actual you know principal itself. But that's why we had a, a Jamaica debt exchange, the JDX, and then a national debt exchange, the NDX. And the majority of Jamaica's debt was actually held internally. It's not outside, it's not the Chinese, it's not Americans. And more than 50% of Jamaica's debt was actually owned locally. And that was a problem. We should know that. And when the government is going in and borrow money, they crowd out the private market. I can borrow government bonds. And if I can borrow as a government, I get to do it from whoever is going to lend me the money. Jamaica wasn't able to borrow from overseas, right? They weren't lending to the, the sick man of the West. And what happened was that if, if I'm an investor and I can get 20% or 14% by buying government bonds, remember the government has the power to tax. So the government is, is the safest person to hold your money unless they're going to the stupidness. You would buy that, which means that mortgage rates were at like 16%, 19%. Car loans were at 22, 25%. It was insane. So they wanted to bring debt to GDP ratio below or equal to 100 in 2012. By 2015, wanted to get to 90. By 2030, they wanted to get to 75. So we didn't hit 100 by 2012. 2015, we were to hit 90. We're in 2019 right now. And what 2019 we've done, we've actually gotten it down to roughly 97%. So we're below 100, so that's, that's amazing. We went from 140 plus percent debt to GDP ratio. And this started under PNP, went under the JLP. It didn't matter who was in charge because the IMF was really in charge. We all know that. And so, the, thanks to the EPOC, right, we had a economic growth count, well, economic council, EPOC was an oversight committee, economic program oversight committee. Hi, Patria, thanks for joining. They really held, whichever administration was important, they held them to account and said, guys, you need to bring this debt down. This is ridiculous. We're spending too much money on debt servicing, not enough on healthcare, on education, on security, and the other things within the budget. So. I can say that the 2030 target is 75, but within the next three years, Jamaica is actually going to hit a debt to GDP ratio of 60 in the next three years. That is a trend that we're on right now. And so we have to give credit where credit is due. We will exceed that target by almost 10 years. So, so that's, a, that's a big one. And that's going to be really important. Uh, we're looking at fiscal balance as a percentage of GDP. Uh, we used to just run deficits like crazy. Uh, Jamaica now has a surplus. Jamaica has a surplus. Th that is something that I, I, I can't remember. I, I was born, I'm sure they had surpluses at that point in time. It actually says we ran a surplus from like 91 to 95 until the financial crisis. But that's, that's a really good thing. There's improvements. And then inflation, man, if you used to live in Jamaica in the 80s or 90s, I wasn't alive in the 70s, but some of you watching this were, we understand how crazy inflation was. In fact, they have a, a graph in here. Uh, I'm going to show you the graph. It's, it's kind of scary, but this was Jamaica's inflation. This number is 57.5%. This number is 80%. That's how crazy our inflation was. Look, that's showing you the years. This is from 1990. So our inflation used to be insane. We brought it down. But you know, the, the targets that, that they had set very simply were 16.8% was inflation in 2007. 16.8%. That's, that's a... You, you can't get 16% in a bank. So you would put your money on deposit. You earn, hopefully, 5% interest. But it can only buy even less next year right you get five percent but the, the dollar the inflation was 16.8 percent so you, you can buy 16.8 percent less goods if you add five percent to your money fine you can buy 11.8 percent less than what you could before that's how inflation works so we, we don't like to inflate away things and so the proposed target in 2012 all the way through 2030 was less than or equal to 10 percent inflation jamaica today 
has a target of 4% roughly for inflation through the BOJ, right, an independent central bank. And you've seen the ads about low and stable inflation is, is like the, the, the baseline of reggae, that's the beat. A really good ads, by the way, by BOJ. But it's really important to understand that we are in the 2% range of inflation. It's actually too low. We need inflation to, to tick up a little bit, but our target is less than a third. Right now we are at less than a third of what the targets were for 2012, 15 and 20. So we've actually knocked that one out the pack, which is, which is unusual. And so we need to, again, give credit where credit is due. And that really goes to the IMF, the EPOC and to administrations from both parties that have managed a program and agreed to it. So, so we're talking about economic growth. I see Marie Curry, Curtis saying her daughter was over there in April. She's going again in the September going next year man that that's 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 what i want to hear we want to hear jamaicans in the diaspora saying that they love jamaica they're making sure their kids grow up understanding jamaica understanding why we love this country so much and wanted to give back right? we in the diaspora are automatic ambassadors whether you want to be an ambassador for jamaica or not when you open your mouth you're an ambassador you can be a good ambassador or a bad ambassador we cannot now run around saying that Jamaica not good, uh, Jamaicans not going out with nothing, Jamaica have crime. We need to be very careful about that. Right? There, there are tourists still going to Jamaica and enjoying themselves. There's business happening in Jamaica. Uh, best performing stock market in the last five years. Best performing stock market in 2018. So, so stuff happening, things are going on. Right? Don't sleep on Jamaica. But it's important as well though to realize that the stock market is not an economy. We want to make sure that we have inclusive growth, right? If the small man don't benefit, that's not enough. It can't be just for the 1% or just the elite in Jamaica. I'm sure we can agree with that. And I, I don't subscribe to the whole chicken down economics thing, right? That don't work for me. It can't be that let the rich people have money and then the scraps, the crumbs fall off the table. That, that's not how it works. We, we need bottom-up economics, right? A rising tide lifts all boats. That's, that's what we all hear. Uh, certainly right now the economy is a rising tide in Jamaica when we look at a stable exchange rate over the last two three years it stayed within a band so yes it will go up and go back down but roughly between 124 and 138 that, that's what we're looking at so it's been fairly stable especially compared to history we have low inflation like two percent amazingly low inflation and that's that's actually really good we have record low unemployment even though we just did see it tick up in, in Jamaica. So, so unemployment did tick up over the last year, but you know, over the last five years, over the last 10 years, 25 years, you know, 20 years as a generation, we have the lowest, man, we have the lowest unemployment ever. And we're seeing youth unemployment coming down as well. So that's important. But then again, we have to also point out some really simple, obvious things. We still have a brain drain problem. And we in the diaspora understand that. We know why we cho chose to leave and live somewhere else. Especially if you're a teacher, a doctor, you can talk about it. You know it, you feel it because you, you felt undervalued, underappreciated. You didn't see investment in the school that you were teaching in. And you got a better offer as a math teacher, an English teacher somewhere else. Especially Canada loves recruiting you. The UK, the US, I mean, if you're a nurse, we know you got any hospital in America, especially in the East Coast. You want the Jamaican nurse. Other people want the Jamaican nurse, right? We know that because we have been trained in a certain way and people appreciate that. But the brain drain is going to continue. If we have 70% of tertiary educated students leaving Jamaica, we're going to have a real problem down the line, right? We already have a problem now, but we're going to have a serious problem later. And that's actually very similar to what happened to Ireland. And, and that was, is one of the ones in this Capri study. This is an older study before we, we got our MF deal that I have. And so Capri is, is based in Jamaica as a Caribbean Policy Research Institute. And it was called a New Social Partnership for Jamaica. I'd gotten a pre-release copy of this to read. A friend of mine had worked there, Kim Marie Spence, is now run by Dr. Damien King. And it was so important, it talked about comparative experiences and Ireland was actually the one they brought up. You know, we, we think of Ireland today as extremely successful. That's where Facebook in Europe is actually based. Dell, Hewlett Packard, a number of those big companies. But they were saying that you know, in, in Ireland, I, I didn't realize this, but in 1996, Ireland faced a recession and was in a state of economic disintegration 
with severe macroeconomic conditions. The economy was growing at a rate of only 0.3%. Sounds familiar to Jamaica. And its gross domestic product was a mere 64% of the European community average. Unemployment was 18.5%. 18.5%. And it was worsening each year. And they actually were having massive you know, outflows of people. They had a brain drain. It was equivalent to 30,000 people leaving each year, which was actual birth rate. That was a number of replacement people. So they were only being able to replace those who left. The population wasn't growing. And so, you know, they were heavily indebted. And they, they had to figure something out. They had to figure out what to do. And so Ireland actually works as a really good example. Uh, we use that in Jamaica when we created our EPOC, right, the, the council. So they had a national economic and social council designed a, a project internally, right? They designed the, the terms internally to fix their country. And one of the key things they did was reinvest in human capital. So that's education and that's trying to make sure that they, they keep people. And they actually call that plan the Program for National Recovery. So I think that Ireland is a great example. We call it the Irish model. Uh, that's something that we, we should be looking at uh, for Jamaica and see what happened. It, but it was it was very interesting to see what they had done. Now, when we look at the issues that we have in Jamaica, I want to see some some other comments. But they listed. We, we literally we have we have the, the issues here, and then we have solutions sitting <laughs> sitting right here. So let's just tick off some of the the ones that they have here that we all know about: fiscal and debt sustainability. So, so we're working on that. We've brought down our debt from 140 plus percent to 97 and going down to 60. So that's good. We have a fiscal surplus. We have net international reserves that are a record high. So this is over 3 billion. And for those who don't know what NIR is, your net international reserves, that's the money that allows you to pay for like importing oil, right? You have foreign currency sitting in the back that allows you to pay for the import of goods. You want that to last a few weeks. Preferably more than 12 weeks. And so we had over 3 billion NIR. That's a good thing. Another problem we say issues and challenges. Well, we always, you know, global economic conditions. We, we've heard the joke that if America sneezes, Jamaica catch cold. And, and that is just unfortunately the way it is when you are living in the shadow of a very large economy. Singapore and China was, was very similar. So that's, that's just how it is for us. We are diversifying our relationships. So Jamaica has relationships with Latin America. Obviously, we, we strengthening ties with places like Ghana and Kenya. So that's that's really good to see. And then we also have strengthened ties you now with Southeast Asia, mainly on the China side of things. Uh, we're not only dependent on America anymore. And so that's that's good. But America is in our backyard, and we are their third border. So we still have to be mindful of that one. Uh, we have a high public wage bill. To this day, Jamaica has not dealt with that. Uh, we keep having freezes, wage freezes. Uh, we have massive complaints about the inefficiency of the public service and the public sector. So uh, some schools are thought, if you listen to the IMF, would say fire like 10,000, 20,000 people. Uh, that would contribute to unemployment, but it would also cause a crime rate to go up. And people, if they don't have good work, they're going to have to find a way to feed themselves. So that's not going to be good. You er erode the tax base as well. So we need to increase, increase productivity, we need to increase efficiency. And sometimes you have to just admit, you know, if people actually got paid more uh, livable wages, survivable wages, then maybe they wouldn't be so corrupt and ask you to pay them to get a license or get a certificate of fitness. I mean, we've dealt with that stuff. So, but we have to find a way to deal with the high wage bill. There's, there's no question about that. So they say we have loss making public entities and, and this specifically named Air Jamaica, the Jamaica Urban Transit Company, and the Sugar Company of Jamaica. So uh, the diaspora is mixed on what happened with Air Jamaica. We're not going to bring that up. No, we all miss our Air Jamaica, but we we sold it, right? And we got that debt problem off our books. The same thing happened with Sugar Company of Jamaica. We sold that. We had five factories. We sold two to private interest in Jamaica. Three were sold to Complant, the Chinese. They are having problems with them. The next one that we say is tax reform. So Jamaica has actually seen tax reform, and we had a, a tax reform committee from 2004. We, we've had multiple ones. So let me check out Marlon's comment before we, we dive into it. Talking about brain drain, don't you think it's hard to keep educated youth interested in education without lowering the crime rate? So, so we have to understand cause and effect, right? So we have a high crime rate. Why do we have a high crime rate? So it's not that everybody born a criminal, you're not born evil, 
right? You don't just get up and say you want to thief and rob and kill. And it's not just that they, they're greedy and want to make a ton of money, right? If you educate a population and give them meaningful work, key thing, meaningful work that allows them to actually survive and feel a sense of pride, those people won't commit crime, right? It, it is, that's causation, lack of opportunity leads to crime. Even if we enforce the laws better, if Jamaica actually had a much better clear up rate than we have because we have a less than 20% clear up rate for murders, for example, we could increase the clear up rate, we could have more prisons, we could have a more efficient court system. It wouldn't matter because we'd be creating more criminals. You can put some in jail, but you just create more criminals. As long as the environment exists to create criminals, you're going to create criminals. Locking them up is not a solution. America has proven that. Versus looking at somewhere like a Sweden or a Norway, the Nordic countries, they look at Singapore. There's a, a discipline problem. We have a, a family values problem. We have problems at home. We have problems at school in the education system. So we need to fix those things and get jobs in. So when we look at BPO, you know, business process outsourcing, call centers, we're moving up the value chain. We actually have some people that saying that a bolo work, I know real work that, right? It's like when we had Garmix back in the 80s and people are stitching collars onto shirts. Guess what? Honest days work, honest days pay. People felt good that they had a job. It's always easier to get another job or move up in life if you're earning something already. If you have to struggle every single week, every single day to put food on the table, just bread for your picnic, you are going to find a way to take care of your child. And you can't just go and say them shouldn't have picnic. Don't, this, is, this is real life stuff. This is not movie. Don't hurt that way. Things happen. right? They already exist. How do we ensure that those people who feel marginalized, who feel that a state has actually abandoned them, doesn't care about this, their security, treats them as lesser than human, as second-class citizens in their own country. Often their skin color is part of that as well. That's, and, and class is a big problem in Jamaica. We, we can't beat around the bush no more. We need to be upfront about this. If we can show those people that we care about them, right, and help them get better jobs, help them get the training that they need, and we see more companies coming in and hiring 60,000, 80,000 people in the call center, it's a start. If you've never had a job before, if you've, you've been in the position where you've been fired and laid off, many of us have had that. You know how it drain your self-esteem, how it feel like, wait, nobody want me, but I have sense. But when you get that next job, you know, you take any job, you get a job, and all of a sudden your pride starts to come back and rebuild, and you feel like you can accomplish and you can build, have a baseline now, foundation covered. That's when you look at like a Sweden with strong social safety nets. Jamaica has a safety net, it's not that strong. We have the, the PATH program, right, P-A-T-H. Uh, we have Heart Trust uh, to help with training, VTDI for vocational training. We have opportunities. So yes, I don't know if it's hard to keep educated youth interested in education without the crime rate. Educated youth can go anywhere in the world, right? Uh, we have to worry about the uneducated youth and we have to worry about the under-educated youth. And Jamaica has an under-education problem, not an uneducation problem, right? We are functionally literate for most people. We don't have an illiteracy problem, but we're not fully literate in some cases. And then we talk about computer literacy. That's, that's another thing in this day and age. So yes, I think it's hard to keep some educated youth interested in education, but let's think about this. You want the best teachers, right? That means you need to pay them. That makes them want to come and teach. Right now in Jamaica, who get up and say, yeah man, me want to be a teacher. Right? That's, that's generally not the thing that somebody is going to say, yeah man, I want to be a policeman, a fireman, a teacher. No, we're saying doctor, lawyer, politician in some cases, businessman. But the people are looking at jobs that pay them well. And for the debt that they're going to take on, for go UA and UTEC and NCU to go to university, they, have, they actually have student loans they need service. So if you're going to take a job, then you have an issue. So, so that is really how we have to look at this stuff. So that's, that's what I would say, Marlon. I appreciate the comment. I think that there's a causation we have to look at. It's not, it's not on the crime side. We actually need to focus on the environment that causes that. So we talk about tax reform. We've had a bunch of tax reform committees in Jamaica. We, we love committees. 
man, we love to get reports, 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 and then don't use them. So this one was 2004, 2004, 15 years ago, which drew on the previous studies of Jamaica's tax system. So it drew on the previous ones. So here what it say. One, we should increase GCT, general consumption tax, right? That's our value added tax. So in the UK, you guys have VAT. America doesn't have a VAT. So we, we can't relate to that. But we did increase that. That's now what, 16.5%. They wanted unification of GCT rates and elimination of special exemptions on certain categories of goods. So every budget, budget presentation, every year, something no longer exempt, something exempt again. We, we've had those issues and we've seen that every year. We wanted reform of property taxes. So we have reformed property taxes in Jamaica. Property taxes hadn't moved for like a decade or more. So property taxes have now adjusted to be more realistic. So I think that's a good thing. But we also wanted elimination of stamp duty and reduction in transfer tax. And that actually just happened. And that's helping our real estate to boom in Jamaica because it's, it's much, much cheaper now to buy a piece of property. It's not this crazy 2.5% of whatever the value is. It was insane. That's, that's crazy. I want to sell the land or pass it on to my children. I shouldn't pay some insane transfer tax. So that actually has taken place. So we were putting things in place. It says we want to increase an indexation of individual income tax threshold. So again, the income tax threshold has moved in Jamaica twice now or so. And so we, we've started at a higher number for you to start charging. You know, paying taxes is over 1.1 million. So I, I like where we're going with that one. So stuff is getting implemented. That, that's, that's important. Of course, it says simplification of payroll taxes. Man. Everywhere in the world need to simplify taxes. Like even America, we just do a tax reform the other day, and it, it actually, some stuff got simplified, some stuff got complicated. So Jamaica is not alone in having a complex tax system. We are simplifying. We, we're getting that one right on the, the doing business in rank, you know, DBI rankings. So that's progress. We still have more to do. I mean, if, if you look at a Jamaica pay slip, you still going to shake your head. But if, if you can at least do centralized payment, that's better. But then this actually says elimination of education and heart taxes. So yeah, that's, that's simplification. Harmonization of corporate income tax and personal income tax rates. Right? The, the, Jamaica has a progressive tax system similar to the US, which means that a certain amount of income, you pay X percent of, of your money as taxes. The next band of income, you pay a higher tax rate above that another tax rate, and you keep going up. Right? In the US, it's up to 37%. So, that is there. Uh, corporate tax rates in Jamaica are lower than, than most people realize. We used to be at 33%, uh, but we've lowered that. So we have like a roughly 25% rate for most companies, but then we have a higher rate for financial firms, so banks, insurance companies, and they have an asset tax. And I do agree with the asset tax because uh, income tax, in my opinion, when you earn money, you should pay tax on it. When I sit on the money, I shouldn't pay tax on it. But that's fine. We, we need to harmonize taxes, but at least we've lowered our tax rate and we, we're more competitive within the region, certainly competitive with the United States as well. But you know, the funniest thing that the report says, the Tax Reform Committee put out a report in 2004 and it ended by saying, commissioning of an independent study on the costs and benefits of incentives to the productive sectors. So a committee on tax reform recommended that we do another tax reform study. That can't work. Jamaica, we, we can't keep doing more and more and more studies. We've done so many studies. Let's implement what's in the studies when they were supposed to be implemented. Let's dust them off today. Let's see what we can do in this day and age. Right, The, the global world has changed. Let's go from there. You see Ansel Cooper saying, I'm, I'm desperate to get my business with healthcare idea going, but I'm a returnee and I've learned we are targeted by criminals. So what can be done for us to help us from being murdered by these evil people? And so I'd say, Ansel, for me, one, we have the Returning Residents Association in Jamaica. The police force is, is set up to really try and, and help returning residents get back into society and integrate in Jamaica. Uh, too often what I've seen is that a lot, not a lot, but there are some returnees who come back, have not been back to Jamaica in 30, 35 years. They think it's the same Jamaica from when they left. So they come back to their little neck of the woods them build them house, them walk in with their cash, they hire these people to build it. Everybody know you're a returning resident. Don't do that. Like you, you need to be smart about the way you want to return to the country and you need to take some more time to figure out where you want to go back to. 
and then find out what, what are the, the places that can help you. Yeah, Jamaica actually has equivalent of the AARP. So if you're elderly, you could join that group. You're going to be able to network with people who are more within your age group, who understand some of the ins and outs within Jamaica. So I think that is going to be an important part. It is unfortunate that returning residents are targeted by criminals in, in some areas. I, I don't think Kingston itself that's a problem. We've seen that elsewhere in more rural areas though. So, so remember it's not the same Jamaica you left. And you don't want to just send back money and a bill of house and, and not do your research before you go there. Treat it like you're moving to a new country. I'll, I'll be honest, you need to be very careful about research. But build a support system. Build a support system. You know, so so look into that. Jean Laurie Chin is one of the people I'd recommend. You, you find her on, on Twitter or Facebook. She could help open some doors. But you know, reach out to Jampro before you go back. You talk to Jampro when you get there. They can also help. I think there's a massive opportunity in healthcare that they're talking about. We, we think about Jamaica. Jamaica is similar to the US in terms of an aging population. Not as far ahead. We do have a higher birth rate, so we have higher replacement. But we have baby boomers too. And we have a lot that are overseas that want to come back. I know you don't want to stay in Canada in the cold. Healthcare good. I know say UK, healthcare good too. US we have some issues with the cost of our healthcare, but you don't want to stay in the freezing cold. You don't want to retire in Connecticut. Let's be honest. You're retiring in Florida or South or moving back to Jamaica is where you want to retire. No problem, Carleen. If you want to move back there, which means we're bringing more people. And Florida kind of full. I'll be honest. I live in Florida. I'm doing this stream from right now from, from Orlando. And I know we hit the 230 mark, but Florida full. And, and we have some issues with healthcare in America. So if in Canada or US or the Northeast, you, you're actually looking to a Panama, Costa Rica, Jamaica. Jamaica is perfect. Oh, and 10 minute flight from Miami. And you're, you're in Montego Bay. Oh, and 25 minute flight from Miami in Kingston. We know our beaches, we know our food. It's healthier, we, we just don't, we don't have the same kind of cancer issues, right? We don't have all this processed food. So we, we pretty much have natural foods. We can't even afford the fertilizer. So that's all good. We have elderly in Jamaica. We don't have as many homes, whether it's adult daycares or you want assisted living facilities. Those are massive opportunities in Jamaica. So Ansel Cooper, you're looking at a healthcare business in Jamaica, you hit your back up the right tree. That is going to be a strong long-term growth industry, both for Jamaicans in Jamaica and for returning Jamaicans. And then third option, you're gonna have Americans wanting to come there, right? They, they move into Mexico. Why I think Mexico have worse crime than Jamaica, you know. Let's get them to Jamaica. So Ansel, work with that. We got Carl Cargill saying, you know, what I would like you to explain to small business why the bank has that you need to have five million in your account to get a loan. The only thing that the bank is not helping our small business to grow and saying is there a micro business organization in Jamaica. So, so yes, there is um there's a there's an SME group, right? Jamaica Business Development Corporation works with MS S MSMEs, micro, small, medium enterprises. And the bank comment, Carl, I, I worked for Jamaica National Building Society three times. I started with Jade Microcredit first, and this was 2001. I helped to design their, their loan products and to explain to the board, pitch the board on what they needed to do for the next five years to, to grow the company. And this was reporting to USAID, uh, Oliver Clark from Gleena and Earl Jarrett were on the board. Yeah. Did my MBA at the University of Miami, went back to Jamaica in 2016. I worked for a year and a half with Jamaica National Building Society. On the business development team, I helped to design mortgages, savings products, loans, and then left and went back and launched their internet banking platform and worked there a third time. And I can tell you this, remember this, banks take our money. It's our savings. We put it in a savings account, they're going to pay us 1%, they're going to lend out the money at three, four, five, seven, eight, ten percent, depending on the risk profile, right? Banks take our money. They lend out our money, so they need collateral. And legally, they can't lend out all the money. You have to put some of it with the central bank that is earning them right now like 0.5%. So a percentage goes to the central bank, the rest gets to be lent out. That's how fractional reserve banking work. We have a fractional reserve system, just like the UK, Canada, the US, most places. Are you comfortable lending your money to a small business that has not been around much, is not generating much revenue and doesn't have any assets? That's risky. It is not the job of banks 
to lend you money when you most need it. It is too risky. Banks lend. The joke is that banks lend money when you don't need it. Banks lend money when you have collateral. That's why they give you a mortgage. They use your house as collateral. That's why they give you a car loan. Your car is collateral. Getting an unsecured loan is extremely hard. And it's not any different in Jamaica. You try to get a loan in Canada or UK or in America. It's called the Small Business Administration. You get an SBA loan because they can guarantee a part of it, but they still want your principal residence as collateral. Small businesses typically are risky, and so banks don't lend where there is too much risk because it's people money that they are accounted for. Jamaica tried that before. That's why we had a financial crisis. It's called Century National Bank and Eagle Merchant Bank. We had these banks that were lending money and all sorts of stuff, did not have the proper risk controls, and they collapsed. And it caused Jamaica to have a financial crisis and it doubled our debt overnight. Overnight. We had to then create FinSAC to save that and pay out the depositors to Central National Bank and pay out the depositors to all these people. We had to save their life from the NCB. That's where all these things ended up. Banks cannot take those kinds of risks. The people that should be taking risk is investors should take risk with small businesses. We need true venture capital in Jamaica. We need true angel investors in Jamaica. And we've seen whether it's our first angels, Jamaica, Mobe Angels is getting there. We have the Branson Center that is helping companies with training, helping the small and medium sized businesses to scale. Training is the biggest part that we're missing. Second biggest is money because the money not going to come unless you have the training. And that is the kind of things that we want to see. I helped to launch a Jamaica Venture Capital Program a number of years ago and spoke at year one and year two conferences. Those are the things that we want to keep seeing happen. The Inter-American Development Bank, the World Bank support those programs. And that's done through DBJ, Development Bank of Jamaica. They've launched what's called the Ignite Program. So, so Carl, that is what. The Ignite Program is actually what we want to see supporting MSMEs I help Jamaica National. When as they relaunch, I support Jamaica. You can go to isupportjamaica.com right now. See a list of small businesses that you can lend money to or investing and help those companies. I created Blue Maho Capital Partners specifically to allow us to raise money in the diaspora to invest back into businesses in the Caribbean, mainly in Jamaica. And that's the goal. We will eventually allow, open it up to, to everybody in the diaspora to invest and then wider people. You know, we have to follow very careful security rules in the United States for that. But that's what we in the diaspora should do. We can take a little bit more risk. We want to support those businesses. That's not the bank's job. You're not going to lend your money to the business. So the bank not going to take your money and lend to the business because the bank is on the hook. So we have to understand what role banks play in the overall financial world. And we, we can't keep blaming them. What, what we need to blame them for is high fees. That's what we need to complain about. Why are you charging us so much money? So let's focus on, on the fees because interest rates have come down, thankfully. And JMMB, though, has announced that they are going to be rolling out some new banking products for medium size and even small businesses. So let's see what happens by the end of this year, possibly into the first quarter next year, I think I trust them. And Keith Duncan in particular has done the interviews. I do work directly with JMMB. In, you know, and so I, I, I have a really good rapport with them. I think that we're going to see some stuff that is interesting and has a way to get banks more supportive of that. But let's just talk about a, a real serious fact. In Jamaica right now, if you're a farmer, you can get a loan to buy a pickup truck because the pickup is now going to be collateral. They get a loan to buy a pickup truck, you turn around and that's to deliver the goods. But if you want to get a loan to buy a tractor to help plant the stuff that's going to make the money, you can't get a loan from the bank. It sounds crazy to us, but then when you talk to the bank, you ask why you won't give them a loan for the productive asset, that's the tractor. And the answer is very simply, we are not comfortable owning that asset if we have to take it from you. Right? If you don't pay the loan, if you default, they take the collateral from you. So they take your pickup from you, they take the truck, they take the tractor. Well, where are we going to sell the tractor? That's, that's literally the answer they've given me. Where are we going to sell the tractor? We don't feel like there's a strong enough market for that. They can take your car, they can take your pickup, they can take your house, they can take your land. That's easy for them to sell. We in the diaspora can actually help finance some of that stuff that the, the farmers need. Because we are more confident in that. 
It would be nice if banks would set aside a percentage of their profits. A bank could set aside 10% of their profit to do higher risk loans. I think that's actually doable and I think that's something that we should push for some more. But it has to have a limit. Like here's no more than X amount of money is going to be focused on higher risk loans. We need to be careful. We saw the subprime crisis in America. You know, once a good thing starts, it just gets worse. We need to be very careful. We don't make the same mistake again. So I've seen you know, Jeremy and Henry, a good friend of mine, running a great company in Jamaica, Flow Factor. And he says, how do we attract overseas talents and companies to Jamaica? Man, it's really, it's really only two ways. So you can do what Ireland did. So Ireland did, did it in, in, in two ways. One, they invested in education. So they educated their people. But more importantly, Ireland lowered their tax rates to 12.5%. So you wanted to get into the EU, you went and set up an Irish company to then go and do business in the EU because the tax rate was lower. So Jamaica could do an offshore financial center. That's what Don Webby has been working on when he was a senator, he worked on that. So offshore financial center, Singapore has done that, China has done that, a number of places. And that way we could lower tax rates in that specific hub, right? Cayman has some of that. So Bahamas does that. That's one way we could provide a low tax rate environment for these international companies. That gives us some advantage, some disadvantage, right? You don't want to race to the bottom. It can't be that let's get to zero taxes and that's how you get companies to come because then it limits the revenue for the, the government. And the government want tax revenue, right? We have special economic zones that will allow that to happen now. So let's see how these cesses roll out. We got one already approved of Marcus Garvey Road. But at the same time, those companies pay payroll and there's still payroll taxes and it's employing people and moving them up the ladder. So sometimes there's a benefit. The other way is to look at what like a Costa Rica did, right? You strike a deal with somebody like a, a Intel and then Intel brings their other suppliers around and build a cluster. Let's pick a area. We're going to then build it here. You give some incentives for say 10 years. We've done, you know, you've seen that with Amazon and their HQ2 in the US. You give some incentives. Intel is going to then have their suppliers come and be near them. More importantly though, Intel needs to train the people to do the fabrication because you don't have those skills yet. And so Intel partners with something like what would be a heart or VTDI to train the people who will end up coming in and working in the Intel factory and with the suppliers. So it has to twin the corporate needs with the educational needs. And so you do twinning. That to me is actually the smarter way to, to bring overseas talent and companies to Jamaica, right? Uh, you also have to change the narrative about Jamaica. If, if people only see the negative side, then they're not going to want to come to Jamaica to do work. So we need to stop focusing on just sun, sea, and sand. And we need to focus on the fact that Jamaica usually places first, second, or third in the Microsoft Imagine Cup every year for like over a decade now. That's a robotics tournament. This is technology. We need to showcase a different side of Jamaica. It cannot just be sun, sea, sand, and sex. We need to be showing them the other things that we're capable of doing. And that means that it can be dependent on tourist board, right? Jampro is using the video that I shot with Michael Leach in that talks about the, our Jamaican economy and what's happening, industries alike. So we will see Jampro roll those out. They've asked me to speak at some of their events as well about investing in Jamaica. So I intend to play a direct role in helping to change the narrative. And that's why I'm doing Island Forward and doing the live version as well. So I think those are the things that we need to do, Jermaine. Like Marlon is saying, you know, with the large influence of Chinese investment in J and the world, do you see any issues within a 5, 10, 20 year plan? Most of that profit made ends up back in China versus Jamaica. I don't see a problem with that. Uh, and it's actually not a large influence of Chinese influence in Jamaica. Chinese money is less than 5% of what's happening in Jamaica. So at the same time, you have to recognize how much of a percentage of the world population China is. If they have 1.2, 1.3 billion people on a planet of 7 billion, they are massive. They were always massive. Why wouldn't you want to do business with that? You can't focus on keeping money in the country. You need to focus on people getting paid. So when the Chinese come and invest in Jamaica and build a factory, they're doing it with alumina. Uh, we're actually going to finally have a power plant, a smelter. Jamaica has never created aluminum. We mine red dirt, get alumina, and then put in a barge and ship it out. Then we reimport aluminum cans to put Pepsi and Coca-Cola in. Because our electricity was too expensive. The Chinese are building their own power plant, and they're going to build a light manufacturing city. They're going to put in like 4 billion US dollars. 
and they're going to hire 60,000 people and they're going to need to train them to do fabrication but we can complain all we want until the profits mostly will be sent out but they're going to pay corporate taxes in Jamaica and that's number one they have to pay property tax in Jamaica that's number two but they hire people they're going to hire 60,000 people that weren't working in higher level jobs value added jobs before so those people are going to get higher pay so we increase per capita income so that's excellent but they have to pay payroll tax so that means we're getting NHT, uh, heart and education tax, people have more money to spend in the community, which means if you have more money to spend in the community, it means you can support Mama V cook shop around the corner, right? And the seam trust we are so close for sending pitting them in to school in. That's what happens when you when one person earns money, it gets spread around the community. So we need to focus on getting people jobs. Then we need to move them up the value chain so they get better jobs. It don't matter if it's a Jamaican company, a Chinese company, an American company. Vietnam is begging US companies to move from China and come to Vietnam. Vietnam growing faster than Jamaica. That's not supposed to happen. We never have no war like Vietnam have. We never have no communists run half the country like Vietnam have. So we need to get over the Chinese part or where the money are go. People are getting hired and going to get paid. That money gets paid in as taxes. That means people are not on the street and idling. It means that they're not going to commit crime because they're working on job. That is a good thing. That is how I see it. So now we're about five year, 10 year, 20 year plan. What you need to be careful of is that you go and take low interest Chinese loans to go and do a project that is not going to work. You end up losing the port and the Chinese take it over. And we've seen that happen in some African countries. Learn from their mistakes. We know how to do that, right? Let's be very careful about that one. That is what you need to worry about. So we see Cian Rose. The presence is growing. Many US companies have now set up call centers in Jamaica, I suspect, because of the English speaking population. I have a couple of accounts now that are serviced out of Montego Bay. And I love that. And that is so true. My friend runs one. You're going to see that interview with him next month. Uh, Yanni Epstein from you know, I tell BPO, I got to see it before you launched it. I got to see it with five people, 30 people, and now they're over a thousand people, and they're in the Bahamas and elsewhere. Uh, Yanni used to be the president of the Business Process Outsourcing Association of Jamaica. And so it, it was really interesting to see how it grew. And, and Sian, you're hitting it on the nail on the head. Jamaica is the third largest English speaking country in the Western Hemisphere. I'm going to repeat that again. Jamaica is the third largest English-speaking country in the Western Hemisphere. It is the U.S., Canada, Jamaica. Let's think about it again. U.S., Canada, Jamaica in terms of English-speaking population. English is our first language. Not Spanish. English is our first language. We are in the same time zone of the East Coast of the United States. We are very Americanized because of American cable. We can pick up accents really easily. We are an educated population. And we are over on 10 minute flight from Miami. So if you want to check on the call center, you can fly down easily because we are so interconnected and we are so close. So Jamaica is ideally suited as a near shore call center and we should move up the value chain, right? We can do back office processing. We have so many people graduating with when there's an accounting degree, we could do a medical degree. We could read x-rays in Jamaica and do telemedicine. I wrote columns about this seven years ago. And that's happening now. They just launched a project with Digicel. We can do this. Jamaica can do this. It's being done elsewhere. Costa Rica, Panama, Colombia. So if you could do Colombia for Spanish speaking, Jamaica for English, and then twin those two things, you can really get some contracts in the U.S. Right? So massive opportunities there we're going to see more bpo taking place but it's not all going to be call centers like in india we're going to be seeing them move up the value chain to the back office processing you look at medical billing in america right for the same money you hire one person in america you could hire three people in jamaica one person or three people that makes sense you know the next thing we're going to have to look at and germany will appreciate this i, I just got an invite today from the u.s state department to go to moldova from september 12th to 14th for a tech event there because what they've seen a simple example actually named a company is like a netflix for a certain kind of products well videos they moved their 10 staff from san francisco got rid of them and moved the programming part of the company to moldova that's over by romania i had to look on the map to move it over to romania and for the same cost of getting 10 people in san francisco they were able to hire 100 100 instead of 10 software programmers so developers software architects full stack developers 
we can't find all of those skills in Jamaica. You, you couldn't come down there and hire 100 full stack developers right now. We need to improve that so that we move in from Silicon Valley to Jamaica, not to halfway around the world where English is their second language. That is where we have some opportunity. We're saying that Cargill, Carl's saying a lot of people running away from BPO because the treatment that they get on the job for this to grow the government, have a setup with these international can do and can't do. So I would actually disagree that a lot of young people running away from BPO. I see a lot of young people running towards BPO. I've met a lot of people down there and I've toured. I was at ITIL BPO last month. I've toured these places. I've spoken to these young people. I've been on campus at UE where we have Sutherland Global is there. You go, you go class and you can go train in the call center and then they have a call center in, in New Kingston, right? So I, I think we need to be very careful about saying that. A lot of young people, not young people need jobs and they need to pay their student loan. So they are taking whatever job they start. They start in digital call center and then they move from there and, and they can scale up. But people are taking those jobs because it is better than nothing because it allows them to pay their student loans. It's a stepping stone to get into the working world. We do need to make sure they're treated better, right? It's the same way we have problems with security guards in Jamaica. We need to ensure that, that management treats these people good and is not new sugarcane plantation type behavior. God, God, we have that problem. So I agree with you, Carl, in the sense of we have to make sure the treatment is better. We don't want to run call center sweatshops you don't want it to be equivalent to that. That's, we're not into that. We, we need higher quality work. So, Karagi said I was going to the community and asked. I've, literally, I've been there. I got, I've been in Jamaica five times since June. Five trips since June. Today is August 27th. So, I spend a lot of time in Jamaica. I'm in Jamaica every single month, at least once. So, I've been in the communities. I got there and we talk to them. Jobs. People want jobs. They would love even better jobs, but they want jobs and they start somewhere. So we're going to start wrapping it up. It's 2.51. As always, I never spend 30 minutes. I think we have more important things to talk about. So it's really more of, of talking for an hour. I love the engagement that we have here. And I think that it's important to recognize that, that something is different this time with Jamaica. We're seeing positive developments. We in the diaspora have very, very specific ways that we can play. You know, Sian is saying that we, we have to be mindful that Jamaica is fairly new third world country with first world ambitions. All things take time. I'm not going to say Jamaica is new. Jamaica, the flag is new, 1962, but Jamaica been around from the 1400s with the Spanish plunder and the, the British takeover. You know, Port Royal at one point was the, the richest city in the Western Hemisphere alongside Boston. They were tied for the richest city. So we've been around for a while. We made money. Some of our resources were plundered. A lot of our resources were plundered. But we should have first world ambitions. And I don't even like the terms first world and third world. I prefer developing country and developed country. A third world makes us sound like we are on some other planet uh, that we, we little and have no sense. I think is to me is actually a derogatory term, so I don't use it. But I would definitely say when I look at Jamaica, we have ambitions. You know why? Because we've seen we saw Lee Kuan Yew, we saw Singapore, same time as us. We see what Barbados has done, what Cayman has done, what Bahamas has done. Why can't we do that? Vietnam going to run past us now. Vietnam going to run past us. We did not have a war like what they had in the 60s. We can't let that happen. Jamaica love being first at everything, right? We lick but with Talawa. That's what we say, lick but with Talawa. Jamaica have the most gold medals per capita in sprinting, 100%. Should have said a new independent country. Yes, that is quite right. Add the context. We are a fairly young independent country. We, we weren't exactly left with the best constitution. We weren't left with the best you know, trading to run our country. We've made mistakes, but we've learned from those mistakes. And we've seen how other countries have done better than us. And so we need to make sure say, we're done. We can't just be winning gold medals in sprinting. We can't just be winning... Grammys for reggae music, right? We do well at certain specific things. We need to be number one at other things, right? India is one of the worst for per capita gold medal in all sports, not just sprinting, right? You, you name a sprinter from India. We can't, but you know what India have? India is booming with technology companies. Infosys from India is doing business in the US. We don't have that happening out of Jamaica, a little bit so. 
It's not that Indian smart than us. Indian parents, India itself values education more than sports. Them love them cricket, but they would rather you go to school, study a book, get smart. Go start a business or go work in a business. We need to value education more because an educated populace is how you attract multinationals. It is how you will launch homegrown companies that can expand to the rest of the world. We look at something like you Usain Bolt Tracks and Records. You see how them open up in a UK now? Franchiser. That's a brand, Usain Bolt Tracks and Records. Why we need, we're going to compete against Bahama Breeze with that. Let's, let's support that kind of thing. We're out here getting Golden Cross. In, in those of us in, in, in America know say, hey man, I can go and get a Golden Cross franchise, my big up Jamaican, that's good. That's great. That's, that's, that's not homegrown. It's still Jamaican, but that's the kind of stuff that we need to be supporting. I love it. Carl said, we just need investors who are willing to run risk and see we grow at a faster rate. Me that, and we have some other people, I agree. We need to come together as a diaspora, as a group of investors willing to take some risk in companies, in brands, in brand Jamaica that we know Cause we know say tall we got we live a foreign and we see how people react to Jamaica. We know our jerk sauce shot. Everybody want it, but the money don't go back to Jamaica. Cause it's not really Jamaican jerk sauce. Let us help those businesses scale and get into the markets where we live and make sure they're on every shelf in the supermarket. Make sure we buy those brands. Let's go to the supermarket that sell that one and buy it. Every time I don't even like red strap. I drink Red Stripe light. Red Stripe to me too bitter. When I'm in Jamaica, I drink Heineken. When I'm in America though, if I see Red Stripe or Appleton for sale in the bar when I go to the club with my friends, I buy at least one bottle. I buy a bottle of Red Stripe. I ask for Appleton. If they don't have Appleton, I ask why they don't have Appleton. If they don't have Red Stripe, I ask why they don't have Red Stripe. We need to truly support our brands. If the quality is there, let us help them have the quantity to make money that supports brand Jamaica and help build Jamaica in a unique way. That is what I, I'm going to leave you with that. I love that, Carl. We need to be investors that are willing to take some risk on brand Jamaica. So I'm going to leave you on that message. I'm going to say big up, one love, let's do this. I'm going to see you next week, Wednesday. Love it, respect, big up everybody on Instagram too. Thank you guys. I'm out.